remember, like Bob Clark and Doug Campbell, they actually devoted a show. What was it called? The Lies of Fletcher yeah, Pratty. The Lies of Fletcher Pratty. What right. a show. Yeah. What an embarrassment. I mean, those. Everything is going to hell down here in Texas. Hola, mi amigos. What is happening? It's your boy, the Triple B, Big Bad Bob, otherwise known as Rob Clark, here with you for another exciting edition of the Lone Gummin Podcast, episode number 252, folks. Today, we're going to get into uh, an article written back in the 1980s by William Weston. But it contains a lot of good information that we may need to reflect upon to help us try to figure out what in the Sam hell was going on inside that school book depository on November 22nd, 1963. But before we do, before we do, we got to hear from our sponsor. That's right. Silk City Hot Sauce. You can help support the show. All you've got to do is order some hot sauce. That's it. You head over to SilkCityHotSauce.com. You place an order. And upon checkout, enter the code GUNMAN. That's G-U-N-M-A-N. For 20% off your entire order. It's that easy. Not only do you get some damn delicious hot sauce, but you can help support this very show that you love oh so much. <laughs> So, Bob, Big Bad, take it away, my friend. Big Bad Bob here with you for Silk City Hot Sauces. Why Silk City? Because this hot sauce comes to you directly from Patterson, New Jersey, also known as Silk City. These hot sauces are 100% natural, gluten-free, vegan, contain no chemicals, fillers, dyes, or junk. Everything is packed into recyclable glass containers, because glass doesn't leach weird flavors into the product. All other hot sauces are sourced in small batches from locally bought fresh peppers. It's all about the pepper people, I'm telling you. Your boy, Big Bad Bob, loves his food like he loves his women. Hot and spicy, but not so hot you can't eat them. <laughs> so, if you love yourself some sauce and you're tired, of trying to transform your bland meat into something edible with the tip of a jar you will transform your life forever head over to silkcityhotsauce.com place an order and upon checkout enter the code GUNMAN that's G-U-N-M-A-N for 20% off of your entire order you won't regret it thank me later Peace. Thank you, Big Bad Bob, for that <laughs> glorious advertisement there. Uh, before we get into the meat of the show, I'm going to clear out a couple things here. The JFK Lancer Conference this year, folks, November 17th through the 19th. At the Lorenzo Hotel in Dallas, if you can get there. If you can't get there, assassinationconference.com for the virtual presentation. You can register now at jfklancerpublications.com for registration details and ticket options. Some of the speakers include Big 
deals like Alan Dale. He's a big deal. Bill Sippich, he's a big deal. John Newman, big deal. Larry Hancock, he's a big deal. Um, Robert Groden, he's a big deal. Bart Camp, he's a big deal. Rob Clark and Joe Borelli, we're big deals. <laughs> now, everybody speaking there this year is a big deal. I jest, but it would take me entirely too long to list every speaker speaking there this year. Um, so just do yourself a favor, head over to jfklancerpublications.com for registration details and ticket options for this year's November in Dallas conference. That's the 27th annual, and this is the 60th anniversary of the assassination of our president. It's a big deal. It's a landmark year, um, and it is a honor and privilege to be presenting this year with my friend Joe Borelli at JFK Lancer. So make sure you are checking that out, folks. Also, friend of the show, Jason Thielman, has created a 60th anniversary commemorative edition Lego art set of JFK. That when completed, you can frame it and hang it on your wall. It is definitely a conversation piece and very unique. In fact, only 60 of these hand packaged sets will be made. So get them while you can. You can email Jason at Jason at the number two BN dot CA. That's Jason at two BN dot CA for details and orders. Order yours today. And if you're going to be at the Lancer conference this year, Jason will hand deliver them to you. And that'll save you about uh, 30 bucks on shipping and handling 30 to 40 bucks. And you can get these sets already put together, so you don't have to put it together. But that's no fun. You know, a Lego set, you're supposed to put it together yourself, folks. So if you put it together yourself, it's definitely about 50 bucks cheaper. And uh, there's 3,400 pieces, so it's very detailed, very intricate, and uh, it looks great. There are two options. One's called the visionary, the man who stood for a strong, peaceful nation. And there's the hopeful, the father to a country with dreams to last generations. And they are both awesome looking. He did a great job. So if you'd like to get yourself something to commemorate the 60th anniversary of the death of our beloved President John F. Kennedy, you can't go wrong with a custom limited edition lego art set again contact jason at 2bn.ca for more details and to order yours today all right let's get into the shizzo for today now had you been following me on youtube and getting notified whenever i drop something there you would already know exactly what i'm going to talk about today and that is The Fifth Floor Sniper by William Weston. One of my favorites. Uh, I guess you could call him a third generation researcher, if you will. And he put together an article that appeared in the third decade, which came out in the 80s at some point. Uh, I don't know exactly when uh, it, it did it, it, or what issue it was in. But a little searching around on Mary Farrell site will get you there. Okay, just put in fifth floor sniper William Weston and you should find it no problem. Now, I wanted to go through this because this is one of the most confusing uh 
portions of the assassination. And that is what is going on inside the school book depository at the time of the assassination. You have all these stories from all these different people, and it's so hard to keep track of, and it's so hard to, uh, you know, who, who do you believe? Whose story do you believe? Do you believe this person? Because they say something different than that person. So do you believe this person and discount that person? And vice versa, and so on and so forth. And it is all very confusing, but hopefully going back and revisiting these things from time to time, like I want to do on this show, will give us a little bit better perspective on where people were and what they were doing at the time of the assassination inside the school book depository. And God bless William Weston. <laughs> hey, you know, uh, folks, this 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 uh this paper was written at a different time. So I'm going to leave out the adjective describing some of the workers in in the uh, school book depository. Uh, I really don't think we need to classify them any further than their name. It doesn't matter. Uh, if they were black, white, purple, green, pink, um, you know, they're, they're people. Okay. So we don't need to call them as he uh, classes them in here, blacks or Negroes or colors or anything like that. So I'm going to try to leave all that out. <laughs> uh, hopefully nothing slips through the cracks, but I'm going to try. All right. So it starts off thusly. An appointment to serve on the Warren Commission was a golden opportunity to lawyers seeking to enhance the prestige of their resumes, yet it surely was not an easy assignment. It was not the goal that was creating difficulties, for that was straightforwardly simple. Prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that one and only one assassin murdered President Kennedy. The hard part was trying to sift through a mountain of confusing government documents and eyewitness accounts and make them fit together in a coherent framework. Among the more daunting challenges they faced was explaining the rapid sequence of hits as shown in the Zapruder film, an indication that more than one assassin was involved. They also had to work with two widely different versions of Kennedy's wounds, as seen by medical personnel in Dallas and by the autopsy doctors in Washington. And somehow they had to figure out how to handle dozens of eyewitness reports which asserted that the shots came from the area of the Grassy Knoll and not from the school book depository. They resolved these and other complex issues in a manner which more or less justified, or satisfied, sorry, uh, the media and government establishments, if not the majority of the American public at the time. Yet there was one problem that gave them no end of trouble, and ultimately it defeated them. It was their inability to explain how the assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald, managed to escape from the book depository that was their formidable stumbling block. Important questions were glossed over by focusing on peripheral matters such as devising elaborate tests, which demonstrated that it was indeed feasible for Oswald to scurry down from the sixth floor the second within the tight parameters of the official chronology. The real issue was not how fast Oswald could move, but rather how he managed to slip by employees who could have seen him. Of the fifth floor, on the fifth floor, there were four witnesses occupying key areas which gave them the potential of proving or disproving the contention that Oswald was on the sixth floor. A critical examination of the testimonies of these witnesses reveals that they are distorted by numerous assertions. I believe that serious consideration should be given to the possibility that a sniper was shooting not from the sixth floor, but from the fifth. Of course, this leads to the question of whether or not the fifth floor witnesses were cognizant of a plot against the president and of the gunman who was preparing to shoot at him. To answer this question, it is necessary to determine who these witnesses were and what they were doing when the assassination occurred. All right, so there's a big, bold claim, folks. William Weston is going to try to prove, through all this testimony and, and yada yada hearsay, 
that the assassin was shooting from the fifth floor and not the sixth. Now, I do find it hard to believe, and this is me, Bob, talking to you here, that uh, had Lee Harvey Oswald been on the sixth floor and descended via the rear stairwell, that he would not have been seen or heard by anyone on the fifth floor, which included uh, three three deposit or three of the uh, <laughs> and I said I wasn't going to do this. Three of the black co-workers, and I only do this to, to differentiate them from the other uh, co-worker of Lee Harvey Oswald that was alleged to be on the fifth floor uh, at the time of the shots, and that's Doherty, who was a whitey. <laughs> so, and then you run into the problem of the girls on the fourth floor that didn't see Lee Harvey Oswald or hear Lee Harvey Oswald coming down the stairs either. And allegedly, upon running into the building, the elevators were stuck on the fifth floor. So the sniper could not have, uh, you know, hopped on the elevator and got down to the uh, first floor and got out of the building. So here we go. Now, one of these workers on the fifth floor was Harold Hank Norman, a 26-year-old who worked at the book depository for two years as an order filler. The same kind of position that Oswald had at the company. The job entailed checking order forms, ret retrieving textbooks from the stock rooms, and bringing them to the shipping department where they were wrapped and mailed out to the public schools that ordered them. A few weeks after the assassination, Norman got a new job at the Foxborough Company, which was in the business of engineer instrumentation. He had a friend named James Jr. Jarman. A 34-year-old man. Between layoffs and rehires, Jarman had worked off and on at the depository for about seven years. His duties were to check the work of the order fillers and help out in the shipping department on the first floor. When the day of the presidential motorcade uh, was to pass through Dallas, Jarman and Norman were outside, standing near the curb of Elm Street, where they thought they could get a close look at the president. Growing crowds along the street were making it difficult for them to see. So, at 12.15 or 12.20, they decided to go back into the building and see the parade from the windows of the fifth floor. There were two elevators that could have taken them to, to that floor, and they were located side by side, occupying a single elevator shaft located along the north wall of the building. For the sake of clarity, the Warren Commission designated one of them as the West Elevator and the other as the East. Jarman and Norman uh, took the West Elevator. A moment or two after they arrived on the fifth floor, they were joined by a third man named Bonnie Ray Williams. His first job after graduating from high school in 19. 62 was washing dishes at the Marriott Hotel in Dallas. Six months later, he was working nights in the baggage department of the Union Terminal Railroad Station. But having a preference for daytime work, he had applied at the Texas School Book Depository and became an employee there in September of 1963. Around the latter part of October, Williams was assigned to a crew that was working on a floor reinforcement project on the upper floors. New plywood was cut and nailed down on top of the narrow planks of the old floor. On the morning of, of the 22nd of November, the floor crew planned to watch the motorcade from the sixth floor. When lunchtime came, the whole crew went down to the first floor to get their lunches. But only one of them, Williams, came back up. The rest of the crew neglected to tell him that they had decided to go outside to see the president. Williams found himself unexpectedly alone, for he neither saw nor heard anyone else on this floor. If there was a gunman lurking in the shadows, Williams was not aware of him. Apparently, he was also unaware of the purpose of the stack of boxes forming a semicircle around the southeast corner window. 
This enclosure was soon to become known as the infamous Sniper's Nest. Only 20 feet from this circumvallation of textbooks cartons was the window where Williams looked out as he quietly ate his lunch. Hearing the sound of voices and footsteps emanating from the floor below, he left the remains of his lunch, a lunch sack, two chicken bones, and an empty bottle of Dr. Pepper on one of the box stacks forming the enclosure and went down by the east elevator to the fifth floor, where he met Jarman and Norman. And together, the three men waited for the approach of the motorcade, each one at a different window. On every floor, there were seven pairs of windows facing Elm Street, according to their testimonies. Williams and Norman each took a window in the pair directly underneath the sniper's nest. Uh, in the next pair of windows, to their right was Jarman. They had to crouch or kneel down in order to see through the open windows because they were built only one foot off the floor. At 12.29, the President's limousine appeared to their immediate front as it turned right from Main Street onto Houston. They watched it as it passed under their window and disappeared behind the foliage of a large tree. It was precisely at this moment that they heard the first shot. Two more shots were fired as the limousine emerged from behind the tree. Norman cried out that the shots must be coming from overhead, for he could hear the shells of a bolt-action rifle hitting the floor. Jarman came over to their side and said, Man, somebody is shooting at the president. Almost immediately after these remarks were made, all three began to run towards the far west window on the opposite side of the floor. As told by Williams, we all decided we would run down to the west side of the building. We saw the policemen and people running, scared, running. There were some tracks on the west side of the building, railroad tracks. They were running towards that way. And we thought, maybe, huh? well, you know, to ourselves, we know the shots practically came from over our head, but since everybody was running, you know, to the west side of the building towards the railroad tracks, we assumed maybe somebody was down there. And so we all ran that way. The way that the people was running, and we was looking out the window. Now what these men were trying to see was the futile search for assassins by police and spectators behind the grassy knoll. The quest for a better view resulted in bringing Jarman, Norman, and Williams to a location which has some very interesting implications. In the back corner of the building, at a distance of about 30 yards from where they were standing, was a stairway. And if Oswald had been on the sixth floor, was it possible uh, for these three men to get an unimpeded glimpse of him as he was running down the stairs? If they did see him, then the case against Oswald would be proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. However, if that were true, then they had to be culpable for not immediately notifying their employer or the police. On the other hand, if they saw no one coming down from the stairs, then it would have been impossible for Oswald to have been present on the sixth floor during the shooting. An FBI report dated November 23, 1963 indicates that the latter possibility is indeed the truth of the matter. Williams was interviewed by Special Agents Will Griffin and Bardwell Odom, who recorded the following words. Williams stated that he and Hank and Jr. were standing where they would have seen anyone coming down from the sixth floor via the stairs, and they did not see anyone coming down. An occupant of the sixth floor could either take the stairs or one of the two elevators to get down to the lower floors. But since both elevators were inaccessible at that time, that left the stairs as the only means of egress. The stairs had two entryways, one leading to a flight of steps going up and one leading to a flight going down. On every floor, there was a landing and a second flight of steps, which led through a passageway, which opened out onto the next floor. To continue the ascent or descent, one would have to walk around to another entryway, which led to another flight of steps. He would have to repeat this procedure over and over with every floor until he reached the floor of his destination. If a fugitive was trying to come down the stairs, he would have been seen during those times when he was passing from one entryway to the next. The fifth floor was not subdivided into rooms or offices like all the lower floors. 
It was an open storage area filled with boxes of school books. Anyone on the fifth floor could have seen the stairway at almost any given point. Even if there was an intervening stack of boxes blocking the line of sight to the stairs, it would only take two or three steps in any direction to bring it back into view. With at least three people on the fifth floor, the potential for detecting an absconder down the stairs becomes practically unavoidable. Since none of the witnesses saw Oswald fleeing down the stairs, the only possible conclusion that could be made is that Oswald did not shoot the president from the sixth floor. William's statement to the FBI must have stunned investigators endeavoring to pin the assassination on Oswald. Yet their situation was not altogether hopeless. One way or another, they had to find a way out of their dilemma. They began a series of interrogations which thoroughly examined the fifth floor witnesses. They also made a survey of the fifth floor where they hoped to find more clues leading to a solution. Their inspection of the premises was not unfruitful, for it yielded a discovery which must have sent a thrill of joy into the hearts of those whose minds were single-tracked on Oswald's guilt. Not far from the stairs were some wooden crates stacked on their sides in such a way that they formed a makeshift storage shelf. It stood over six feet high and extended 15 feet from the west wall, just far enough that it concealed the stairs from the southwest corner. According to Williams and Roy Truly, the superintendent in charge of the book depository, the shelf had existed at this location long before the assassination. Photographs were made of it, and the examination of these pictures reveals that it is true that the shelf prevented the three men from seeing Oswald. Law enforcement officials also learned from Williams that the two FBI agents erroneously recorded a statement that he never made. Williams declared that it was not true that they were in a position to see the stairs, for the storage shelf completely obstructed their view. An elephant would walk by there and you could not see him, Williams would later tell the Warren Commission. That shelf, however, was only workable from the standpoint of the west side of the building, and only within a time span of just a minute and a half. That was their maximum available time to go from the southwest corner window all the way over to the west wall. If they lingered too long, they would have had an unambiguous line of sight to the stairs at a time when Oswald had had to use them. According to the Warren Commission calculations, Oswald had only 90 seconds or less to hide his rifle and descend from the sixth floor down to the second floor lunchroom where he was seen by two witnesses. The maximum time can be reduced even further if we consider that it would have taken him about 30 seconds to make his way down the stairs. This can be broken down to a speedy 7.5 seconds per floor. Oswald had to be on the fifth floor, landing no later than 60 seconds after his last shot. Consequently, Jarman, Norman, and Williams also had a 60-second time limit. If they took longer than a minute in moving over to the west wall, then they would have failed to reach the only place on the floor where they could have missed seeing Oswald. If Oswald was using the, the time to run across the sixth floor and hide his rifle near the northwest corner, what were the three men on the fifth floor doing? Piecing their accounts together, we find that this single minute of time is densely packed with activity. To recap what they were doing, we have Norman's declaration that he just heard uh, rifle shells landing on the floor above them, and Jarman's assertion that someone was shooting at the president. Then all three were distracted by the large number of people rushing the grassy knoll, impelling them to make the headlong dash to the west end window. It is conceivable that all this could happen in a brief period of time, yet a description of their actions would not be complete until one more detail is added. It was not included in the Warren report, but it was mentioned several times during the hearings by various witnesses. One of these witnesses, Robert Bob Jackson, a photographer riding with other newsmen in an open-top press car, saw two men in a window on the fifth floor. After the last shot, I guess all of us were just looking around, all, all around, and I just looked straight up ahead of me, uh, which could have been looking at the school book depository, and I noticed two men in a window straining to see directly above them, 
and my eyes followed them right up to the window above them, and I saw a rifle. Jackson's attention was caught by the sight of two men leaning out the window with their faces turned upwards towards the floor where the shot supposedly came from. Such irrepressible curiosity was so conspicuous that other observers on the ground testified to seeing them. The two men turned out to be Williams and Norman, who readily acknowledged to the FBI in the days following the assassination that they were indeed trying to see the sixth floor window. But that was the last time they said anything about it. Four months later, during the hearings, Norman was asked about this visual searching for a gunman, and he denied he ever did it. This disaffirmation dis cannot be taken too seriously, for Jackson's observation was corroborated by three other witnesses. Seated in front of Jackson was another news photographer named Tom Dillard. He was not quick enough to see the rifle that Jackson saw, but he did proceed to take two pictures of the window Jackson was pointing at. One of Dillard's pictures shows a substantial portion of the east side of the building, and the second picture is a close-up view of the eastern corner windows of both the fifth and sixth floors. The faces of William and Norman are clearly seen in the fifth floor window. This picture must have been taken immediately after the two men had discontinued their attempt to see who was doing the shooting, for they were no longer looking up. Dillard's camera caught them at a unique instant of time, after their upward glance to the sixth floor, but before their pell-mell rush to the west corner. Yet the more one examines the picture, the more questionable it looks. Is this really an image of two men on the verge of springing up from a kneeling or squatting position and running off down the aisle? They do not appear to be interested in the riveting scenes below them, but rather they seem to be gazing pensively towards the horizon as if they are looking at nothing in particular. Their facial expressions do not give a hint that they have just seen an appalling murder. Instead, they have the appearance of two men waiting for something to happen. On March 20th, 1964, a photographer went up to the fifth floor with Jarman and Norman and Williams in order to take pictures of them in the positions they had assumed when they were waiting for the motorcade. The pictures are printed in Volume 17, pages 202 and 203 of the Warren Commission hearings and exhibits. A comparison of these interior views of Norman and Williams shows that they are in poses strikingly similar to the postures they were in when the Dillard picture was taken. In fact, the Dillard photo seems to be more in keeping with a waiting for the motorcade type of picture rather than as a portrait of two men who just heard a rifle firing only eight feet above their heads. It is entirely possible that the so-called Dillard photos were not taken by Dillard on November 22, 1963, but by someone else on March the 20th, 1964. Hmm. That's an interesting assumption. Doubts about the Dillard photos only deepen when an attempt is made to fit them into the context of the testimonies of the witnesses on the ground. After James Alchins took his historic pictures of the presidential limousine under fire, he saw two men leaning out of a pair of windows, not the one directly below the sniper's nest window, but the pair immediately to the west of it. Forrest Sorrells, a Secret Service agent riding in a car preceding the limousine, saw two men not in the window below the sniper window, but in the area, in an area to the west of it. Sorrells returned to Dealey Plaza and talked with a man named Howard Brennan, who saw the two men after the shooting in the same area that Sorrells saw the men. Brennan repeated this observation to the Warren Commission and clearly marked on a photo of the book depository a pair of windows below and, and to the west of the sniper window. When Brennan was challenged with the evidence of the Dillard pictures, he became confused and admitted that he may have made a mistake. The only witness who positively stated that the men were in the corner window was Robert Bob Jackson. However, it is possible that the excitement of seeing a rifle in a sixth-floor window may have led to an incorrect perception of which windows the two men were in. Nevertheless, Jackson's doubtful statement prevailed over the versions given by other street-level witnesses because the testimonies of Jarman, Norman, and Williams gave Jackson's version solid corroboration. The three men appeared before the Warren Commission on March 24, 1964, 
to put on record their experiences of the assassination. In addition to giving their stories, they were also called upon to correct a lot of errors made by agents of the FBI, especially Williams. He did not tell them, for example, that he spent only three minutes on the sixth floor. It was more like 10 or 15 minutes. Neither did he say that he took the stairs down from the sixth floor to the fifth. He really took an elevator. Although the FBI managed to accurately report that he observed a policeman coming up the stairs, Williams did not tell them that the policeman searched the whole floor. He simply walked from the stairs to the elevator without stopping. He then took the elevator to an upper floor. And finally, Williams emphatically denied that he told anyone that it was not possible for someone like Oswald to come down the stairs without being seen. With these and other difficulties in the process of being cleared up, the Warren Commission was well on its way to wrapping up its case against Oswald. Yet, there was one question that they could not answer. In the end, they simply bypassed it entirely. It concerned a fourth witness on the fifth floor, Jack Doherty. And I think I called him Charles before. But yes, it's Jack Doherty. Sorry. Was he in a position to see Oswald as he was coming down the stairs? Doherty was a 39-year-old shipping clerk who worked at the book depository for over 11 years. He was a loyal, conscientious, hard-working employee who enjoyed his work. He was never married, and he lived at home with his parents. Although he was described by his employer as a, quote, emotionally immature, having a childlike disposition, his intelligence was in no way impaired. When the presidential motorcade was touring the city of Dallas, Doherty was not waiting for it. He had gone back to his work after his lunch break. While he was on the fifth floor moving some stock, he heard a single shot, not three. More significant than the number of shots that he heard was the place where he was standing, ten feet west of the west elevator. The diagram on page 24 shows where Doherty and the three men were one minute after the shots were fired. The spot where Doherty was located, ten feet west of the west elevator, would place him only five feet from the staircase. A fugitive coming down from the sixth floor would have had to pass almost within an arm's reach of Doherty. If someone had been using the stairs, then apparently he had passed by unnoticed, for Doherty made no mention of him. But this is not the only problem connected with Doherty's close proximity to the stairs and elevators. About two minutes after the shooting, someone brought the west elevator down from the fifth floor to the first. Who was this person? In order to understand the crucial importance of the west elevator problem, it is necessary to examine the testimonies of two witnesses who saw it from the first floor. One of them was Marion Baker, a motorcycle patrolman who was charged with the duty of escorting the presidential motorcade. When the shots were fired, Baker uh, thought that a sniper was on the roof of the book depository, and after parking his motorcycle, he raced up the front steps and into the lobby, where he called out to the people inside that he wanted immediate access to an elevator. Roy truly volunteered to show him the way. When they came to the elevators, they tried to bring one down, but a temporary power outage in the building prevented the elevators from operating. They looked up the elevator well and saw both elevators stuck on the fifth floor. So they decided to take the stairs. They had gone up one floor. When they found a Lee Harvey Oswald lurking in the lunchroom, Baker thought he looked suspicious, but truly reassured him that he was merely a company employee. They continued their climb up the stairs. When they reached the fifth floor, they decided to use an elevator to carry them the rest of the way up. The elevators were operating again because the electrical power to the building had been restored sometime during that half minute when they were between the second and fifth floors. They did not take the west elevator, which would have been the one closest to them as they were coming off the stairs. Instead, they had to take the east elevator. Someone had already used the west elevator to go down from the fifth floor. We know that Oswald could not have used it, for there was not enough time for him to ride the elevator from the fifth floor down to the second in the same time that it took Truly and Baker to go up from the first to the second. 
Jarman, Norman, and Williams did not use it, for they took the stairs down. Furthermore, Williams saw Baker as he was walking from the stairs to the elevator. This observation could only have taken place after someone had used the West Elevator, and that leaves only Jack Doherty. And the Warren Commission concluded that he was probably the one. Doherty's testimony confirmed this conclusion, for he himself said that after hearing a shot, which he described as a loud noise, he immediately took the elevator down to the first floor where he ran into Eddie Piper and asked him, has the president been shot? Piper's reply was in the affirmative. Putting together the data which the Warren Commission has given us, we have the following sequence of events. 12.30. Doherty hears a shot. He is 10 feet west of the west elevator. 12.31. Oswald comes down the stairs, passing within 15 feet west of the west elevator. 12.32. Truly and Baker encounter Oswald on the second floor. 12.32 as well. Doherty uses the west elevator to go down to the first floor. 12.33. Truly and Baker arrive on the fifth floor and get in the east elevator to go up to the seventh floor. The rapidity with which these occurrences were taking place, give Doherty no time for random movements, which would put him beyond the reach of a clear view of Oswald fleeing down the stairs. No attempt was made by the Warren Commission to explain how Doherty could have missed seeing him. Yet Oswald was not the only one Doherty would miss seeing, for he also seemed to be completely unaware of the presence of Jarman, Norman, and Williams also on the same floor. From where he was standing, he should have been able to look past the storage shelves near the stairs and see his fellow co-workers at the far west window. When Doherty was asked if, I, if he saw anyone else on the fifth floor, his reply was an emphatic, No, sir, I didn't see nobody. There wasn't nobody on the fifth floor at all. It was just myself. Despite this unequivocal declaration, Doherty should have seen the three, the three other men on the fifth floor. At least he should have heard them, especially as they were moving to the west side. Three men running on a wooden floor would have made a terrific clatter, as Williams himself readily acknowledged. But, Doherty was not the only one who seemed to be insensate to his surroundings. If the men at the west corner window missed seeing Oswald because the storage shelf was blocking the view, at the very least they should have been able to see Doherty, who was between the storage shelf and the elevator. Yet he was seen by none of them. The impersipence of these four witnesses is beyond the realm of possibility, and it is at this point that the fractured edifice of the Warren Report really breaks down. Like a compass rotating wildly in a polar region, our sense of direction on the fifth floor is radically impaired by some ominous force. Testimonies which should have been clearly understandable become bewildering enigmas. To regain our bearings, we need to go outside the fifth floor and see it from the point of view of spectators on the ground. On Houston Street, waiting to see the president, were two clerks, Ronald Fisher and Robert Edwards. According to their affidavits, they saw a suspicious-looking man on the fifth floor about a minute before the appearance of the motorcade. The next witness to see this man was Carolyn Walther, and she noticed that he was armed with a rifle. Standing next to him was another man in a brown suit coat, because investigators have concentrated their efforts on the sixth floor as the scene of the crime. It had been assumed that Edwards, Fisher, and Walter had miscounted the floors of the building, incorrectly designating the sixth floor as the fifth floor. While it is true that these witnesses caught only brief glimpses of the suspicious men, hampering their ability to recall from memory what they had seen, experienced policemen, who had time to correct initial false impressions, were also making the same error throughout the afternoon. At 12.36, a police sergeant radioed headquarters that he had a witness who said shots came from the fifth floor. At 12.46, a dispatcher stated on the radio that according to the information thus far received, the shots came from either the fifth or fourth floor. At 1.12, an inspector of the police reported that empty shells were found on the fifth floor as well as evidence indicating that a man had been there for some time. A number of people came to the same inspector to tell him that they saw a rifle, part of a rifle, 
projecting from a window which the inspector thought was on the fifth floor. Newspaper reports indicated that the rifle was a Mauser. Also reported was the discovery of the remains of a chicken lunch left by the assassin on the fifth floor. Reading the police radio transcripts alone, it would appear that the police were focusing the searches on the fifth floor, but a reading of the testimonies of police officers demonstrates that they were finding evidence on the sixth floor. <clears throat> if police authorities at their command post outside the building were directing their men to the fifth floor, how did the police inside the building manage to switch gears and begin an all-out search on the sixth floor? We have no clear answer to that question. Uh, when Deputy Luke Mooney was asked if he had any reason to go to the sixth floor, his reply was, No, sir. That is what I say. I don't know why. I just stopped on that particular floor. When Deputy Eugene Boone was asked if someone ordered him to go to the sixth floor, his reply was equally vague. Well, that is just where everybody was going. By the time Captain Will Fritz arrived at around one, all investigative probes were channeled to the sixth floor, but the fifth floor report of seeing a rifle in a sixth floor window was printed uh, in the same news story that also reported that evidence of an assassin was found on the fifth floor. The accumulation of the above facts seems to indicate that Walter, Edwards, and Fisher were not incorrect in their observation of a gunman on the fifth floor. For what had for what amounted to only brief glimpses, their description of him was remarkably detailed. He was wearing a white shirt and had blonde or light brown hair. Carolyn Walther said that he was partially leaning out just slightly and he had his forearms on the window. And it was not a long rifle. It was a short gun, not a pistol. I had never seen one like it. She also said that the rifle had a short barrel and looked more like a machine gun. It did not have a telescopic sight or a leather sling. Standing next to the man holding the gun was another man in a brown suit coat. His head was not visible because it was above the open portion of the window. The movements of the brown suit coat man after the assassination are carefully analyzed by Josiah Thompson in his book, Six Seconds in Dallas. After the Walther sighting, he was seen again in a few minutes after the shooting by James Worrell who saw him running out of the back door of the depository, heading south on Houston. He was next seen by Richard Randolph Carr, a steel worker at the corner of Houston Commerce. He had previously observed this man around noon at a window on the seventh floor. The second time Carr saw this man was after 1230, walking very fast, proceeding south on Houston, and then turning left on Commerce. In addition to his brown suit coat, we also learned from Carr that he was wearing a hat and he had on horn-rimmed glasses. When he stepped into a 61 or 62 gray Nash Rambler station wagon parked along the street, the driver was described as a young Negro. The brown suit coat man was last seen as a passenger of this car going north on Record Street. The Nash Rambler and the driver are next seen at 1245 by Marvin Robinson, who saw no passenger with him. The vehicle stopped on Elm Street and a white male came down the grassy incline and entered the station wagon. The car sped away towards the Oak Cliff section of Dallas, and a deputy named Roger Craig also saw this incident and reported to his superiors what he saw. Later that afternoon, he identified Lee Harvey Oswald, who was then in custody at City Hall as the man who got in the Nash Rambler driven by the dark-skinned man. The brown suit coat man and the white shirt man with a gun had been on the fifth floor in the far east pair of windows. The two black men who were seen by several witnesses staring at the upper levels of the building were not in far east windows, but in the next pair over. This, of course, puts them within speaking distance of the sniper team. Possibly, their upward glance to the sixth floor was part of a plan to deflect suspicion away from the fifth floor. The man on the sixth floor might have been flourishing a decoy gun for the benefit of the spectators on the ground. Only one shot was heard, heard from the fifth floor, which was the shot that Doherty heard. Other shots were coming from other snipers posted around Dealey Plaza. 
The fifth floor gunman was probably an employee of the book depository who could afford to stay in the area and could easily blend in with other employees who were willing to confirm his alibi. The brown suit coat man was a stranger to the people of the book depository, and therefore it was imperative that he leave the building as quickly as possible. The elevator was the only way he could have escaped, for if he came down via the stairs, he would have collided with Cooley and Baker as they were coming up. It was the man in the brown suit coat who took the west elevator at 1232. A cluster of boxes piled on the elevators could have provided concealment for him, and someone, perhaps Doherty, could have served as his escort out of the building. Worrell's sighting of him coming out the back door around 1233 demonstrates the fact that the culprit was not wasting his time. The only way he could have departed from the building was the same way that he uh, effected an entrance, through the aid of trustworthy collaborators who were employed in the book depository. He could not do it alone, for the risk of detection would have been too great. Someone had to escort him in and out, making sure the access routes were clear of ordinary employees who might suspect something. Getting into the building would have been easy, for most of the employees were out front waiting for the motorcade. Getting out was an entirely different matter and involved some tricky maneuvering in order to slip by people who had been alerted to the emergency situation. Near the elevator on the first floor were two men, William Shelley and Billy Lovelady. If these two employees had taken this position prior to 1232, they could have seen the brown suit coat man as he was running out the back door. It is therefore of critical importance to establish when Shelley and Lovelady had arrived at this location. According to their testimonies, they were standing on the front steps of the book depository when the motorcade came by. Hearing shots which sounded like they came from the area of the grassy knoll, Lovelady and Shelley ran to the divider that split Elm into two streets. They saw Truly and Baker going into the building. They saw police officers running toward the tracks, where a sniper was thought to be located. The two men decided to follow the police, walking over to the parking lot that adjoined the railroad yard. After watching policemen search the cars in the parking area, they went back to the book depository. And once inside, they received an assignment from Truly to guard the elevators and the stairway, debarring anyone from using them. By the time they reached the elevators, the brown suit coat man would certainly have been out of the building. However, their testimonies are not consistent with the affidavits they submitted on the day of the assassination. As Sylvia Marr and yours truly, Big Bad Bob, has pointed out on previous shows. Their affidavits said nothing about their circuitous route around the west side of the building. It merely said that they merely said that after they saw the shooting, they went back into the building. Their testimonies are also not consistent with other eyewitness accounts. Victoria Adams, who was coming down the stairs with another employee, Sandra Stiles, remembered seeing them near the elevator. Uh, about a minute after the shooting, she told Shelley and Lovelady that she believed that the president had been shot. They made no reply. Soon after Adams and Stiles ran out the back door, Truly and Baker came to the elevators. Although Baker did not know their names, he did remember seeing two white men sitting nearby. If Truly had given Lovelady and Shelley the responsibility of guarding the elevators, this was the only time he could have done it. The next time Truly was down on the first floor, the whole book depository was in a turbulent flux warming with law enforcement personnel and members of the news media. It would have been essentially pointless to have guards near the elevators during this time. It is clear that Shelley and Lovelady were given their orders to watch the stairs and elevators at a time no later than 12, 1232. With Truly and Baker proceeding up the stairs, the brown suit coat man was coming down via the elevator. When he stepped off the elevator and ran out the back door, he must have passed Shelley and Lovelady. Yet no mention of the fleeing man was ever made by the two elevator guards. At 12.31, Truly and Baker were compelled to use the stairs because of a power outage. But at 12.32, the power somehow came back on, allowing the man in brown to get away. 
If the power failure lasted a minute or two longer, the conspirator might have been captured by Officer Baker. The precise timing of this resurgence of electricity suggests that it was being deliberately controlled by someone endeavoring to help this man get out of the building. This would require some sort of remote communication device such as a walkie-talkie to coordinate this complex escape operation. When Truly and Baker reached the fifth floor, the restoration of the electrical power also allowed them to use an elevator, which they took to the very top floor, the seventh floor. From there, they, claimed that they climbed a flight of stairs up to the roof. Baker made a sweeping search of the rooftop, looking for clues indicating that a gunman had been there. He saw that the ledge on all sides of the roof was five feet high, too high for someone using a rifle. He also climbed the ladder on the Hertz rent car sign, but he soon realized the sign had no suitable perch for a gunman. Truly, who was waiting patiently, said to Baker, I think we're wasting our time here. I don't believe these shots came from this building. Baker agreed, and they both went back into the elevator and returned to the ground floor. Since Baker's original responsibility was to stay with the motorcade, he immediately left the building, got back on his motorcycle, and rode off in the direction of the hospital. As for Truly, he turned his attention to the surging multitudes of people who were transforming the book depository into what he described as a regular madhouse. Yet the police were not slow to restore order. They quickly sealed off the building, allowing no one to leave or enter without due authorization. They began a systematic floor-by-floor floor search, questioning employees as they went and recording their statements in little notebooks. As they approached the upper floors, they had to proceed with caution, for they were not sure whether or not an armed suspect was still in the building. They thought that he might be holed up on the top floor. Then sometime around 1240 or 1245, the book depository was again plunged into the darkness by a second power shutoff. What started as an orderly police investigation turned into mass confusion. All attempts to find an upper floor suspect were soon halted because it was too dark to see. Deputies were sent across the street to the sheriff's office in order to bring as many floodlights as they could carry. Deputy Luke Mooney, who was on the first floor, vividly described how the power outage affected him. He says, I noticed there was a big elevator there, the west elevator. So I jumped on it, and at about that time, two women were running and said, We want to go to the second floor. I said, All right, get on. We're going. I got a hold of the controls, and it worked. We started up and got to the second. I was going to let them off and go on up. And when we got there, the power undoubtedly cut off because we had no more power on the elevator. So I looked around their office there, just, just a short second or two, and then I went up the stairs myself. Shortly after Mooney left, two more officers got on the elevator, followed by Victoria Adams. She wanted to go back to her office on the fourth floor. The three of them soon realized that the elevator was not going anywhere. The power had been cut off. Adams told the Warren Commission some months later, they stepped off the elevator and went up the stairs to their respective destinations. The power outage lasted about five or ten minutes. And speculating what purpose it could have served, it is possible that there really was a suspect on the roof or the top floor, and he might have overcome the five-foot ledge problem by the simple expedient of bringing up a wooden box uh, upon which he could stand. A little after one o'clock, a rifle was found by policemen searching the roof. Baker must have somehow overlooked a hiding place when he was exploring that area. Unlike Oswald's man liquor Carcano, the rooftop rifle lacked a sling and telescopic sight. It also had a barrel approximately three inches longer. The suspect had been on the seventh floor, the power shut off, and the resultant breakdown of police efforts to find him presented an opportunity to make a getaway. Just as the first power outage enabled the brown suit coat man to get out of the building, so the second outage helped the rooftop man. Perhaps he had phony FBI or Secret Service credentials to suspend any suspicion people might have had as he was leaving the building. 
As we come to an understanding of what people were doing in the book depository, we find unmistakable evidence that the assassination of President Kennedy was not carried out by one man. Correlating the eyewitness accounts of those who were inside the building with those who were outside reveals that the testimonies of Jarman, Norman, Williams, and Doherty are replete with inconsistencies, contradictions, and retractions, and therefore should be considered unreliable. An examination of just the street witnesses' testimonies alone gives clear evidence that more than one gunman was involved. Although the fifth floor witnesses might have been privy to an assassination plot, it is possible that they did not have any malevolent designs against the president. Perhaps they were unwilling participants in a calamity that might have deeply shocked them. Truly informed the Warren Commission that, quote, they have been rather, as the expression goes, shook up about this thing, especially this tall one, Bonnie Williams. He is pretty superstitious, I would say. The assassination of President Kennedy was a multi-sniper operation which required a highly sophisticated level of organization and coordination. The plot was skillfully and boldly and boldly executed by assassins who knew how to evade even the most vigorous pursuit of law enforcement agencies. The factual existence of such ruthless killers is one of the more frightening implications to emerge from the assassination record. And that is the end of the William Weston essay about the fifth floor shooter. So, what do you guys think about that? <laughs> um, I honestly don't know what to think. The fifth floor has always eluded me. Um, I find it hard to believe that Norman, Jarman, and Williams didn't see Doherty, and Doherty didn't see them. Because, you know, after the shots, you would think that Norman, Jarman, and Williams would be hollering at each other, talking to each other, moving around, getting to the other window, and generally making a commotion that Doherty would surely have seen. And you would think that they would have heard Doherty taking the elevator down from the fifth floor to the first floor. I mean, it's not like these elevators were silent. These are big, large freight elevators in 1963. They were probably creaking and squeaking and uh, you know, the motors are running, making a hell of a racket. So it's all very, very convoluted. And I don't know that we cleared up anything here today <laughs> at all. Um, but hell, at least we tried, you know. And, you know, and I do understand that people not familiar with the building as they're counting floors, or, you know, could easily mistake, you know, the fifth or sixth floor. Or they could, you know, mistake the fifth floor for the sixth floor and so forth and so on. And, you know, if you're inside a building, you run up a stairwell that you're not familiar with, unless there's a sign at every floor saying fifth floor, sixth floor, seventh floor, you're not going to know either what even floor you're on if you're running up, you know, unless you are counting as you go up, which, you know, cops might do. I don't know. Um, it's certainly a very interesting proposition and definitely uh, lends credence to the supposition that an actual assassin, if he were inside the building, could have gotten outside the building from the elevator on the fifth floor before anybody came in the building and saw him. So take that for what you will, folks. It's all very interesting, you know? It's all very interesting. Um, like I said, if you'd like to learn more about that, head over to Mary Farrell and uh, search up William Weston, fifth floor, and it should pop up in one of these third decade uh, deals over there. Um, so that's it for your boy. Make sure you're following all the socials at the Lone Gunman 7. And also, make sure you are subscribed and getting notified on YouTube. Uh, 
you don't want to miss the shorts. They give you a little heads up as to what's coming up on the show. And uh, let's just say big things are coming sooner than later. So you might want to keep an eye over there, folks. That's all I'm saying. Just keep one eyeball over there. All right, this is your boy. I'm out. Peace. Enjoy the hit conspiracy by Shepherd of Fire. Listen to the words and rock out, baby.